Good morning and welcome. My name is Tabang Chilwani. I'm the Executive Head for Strategic Relations and Public Affairs at NetBank. The conversation today considers the issue of data privacy, or what others may call information privacy. NetBank, in collaboration with our stakeholders, the EE Business Intelligence and the Johannesburg Center for Software Engineering at Wirtz University, are privileged to bring you this dialogue on data privacy. There are millions of people in the world today who do not know about how their personal information is being collected, shared or used in our digital society. We believe it is critical that our information or data is handled properly. What that means is that we, be, we believe we should consent to how it is used or even stored. Specifically, where and how our data is shared with third parties. We believe such should happen legally within the confines of existing law. We are grateful for the opportunity to facilitate this dialogue and hope it will empower individuals and companies to act and to become part of um, something big. I'm your moderator today, together with Prof. Barry Dolaski, the Emeritus Professor and founder of the Johannesburg Center for Software Engineering at Vets University. Prof. Barry, over to you. Thank you very much, Tabang, and welcome everyone to this webinar. This is the third of our, of our um, series of webinars sponsored by Ned Bank in partnership with um, EE uh, Business Intelligence. And we are looking in this um, series at living in the connected world. And as Tabang has said, the question we're looking at is who owns my data and why should I care? Uh, we've got a fantastic panel for you today. And uh, to kick us off, if I can welcome Ms. Uh, Priyabani, uh, uh, Priyabashni Naidu, who's the um, Group Executive for Group Strategy at NetBank and is effectively our host in this uh, webinar. And if I can call on Priya to welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Professor Barry, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Priya Naidu. I am the Group Executive for Strategy for the NetBank Group. And uh, it was my honor to be able to welcome you all to the to the session uh, of the webinar uh, this morning. My role is to introduce Professor Cochrane. And with such a long and illustrious career, I do hope to be able to do justice to that. Um, futurist, innovator, academic, father, husband, these are just some of the few adjectives that are used to describe Professor Cochrane but certainly not enough to encapsulate his over 40 years of professional engagements in science, technology, and engineering. Professor Cochran is the Professor of Sentient Systems at the University of Suffolk. Uh, he is committed to solving human challenges and the creation of wealth through the application of new technologies and business solutions. Those of you who may have visited his website uh, online would have noticed that Professor Cochrane has had the good fortune of uh, working with exceptional people in government, companies, and major international operations, and has succeeded in creating and managing teams of over two and a half thousand people with budgets in excess of uh, one billion pounds. In 1990, Professor Cochrane received the Queen of England's Award for Innovation and Export, and in 1999 was also awarded the Queen's Order of the British Empire for his contribution to international communications. In addition to his previous and current senior roles, which include Chief Technology Officer, Chief Executive Officer and Director in the UK and the US, Professor Cochrane has been a visiting professor, advisor and external examiner to major universities in the European Union and in the USA and continues to be actively engaged as a consultant, speaker, mentor uh, with investment interests in startup companies. But that's not all. Uh, Professor Cochrane very much enjoys teaching and sharing his experience with students and well with anyone who, who cares to learn. He's enjoyed an extensive career at uh, British Telecoms, 
where he rose to the head of R&D and CTO, and his thousand strong team at the time pioneered optical fiber networks, speech technologies, uh, technologies, artificial intelligence, artificial life, augmented reality, virtual reality, telemedicine, telecare, quantum encryption, networks, mobility, uh, complex systems and economic metrics, but to mention a few. Yeah. So with these few words uh, on behalf of the Nedbank Group, our stakeholders, uh, EE Business Intelligence, as well as the Johannesburg Center for Eco uh, Software Engineering, it is my singular honor to welcome Professor Peter Cochran to the dialogue, Living in a Connected World, Who Owns My Data? Why Should I Care? So. Without much further ado, can I hand over to you, uh, Professor? Well, thank you so much, Pray. That was a, a terrific uh, introduction and uh, pleased to be with you, everyone. And uh, my mission this morning is to see if I can get you to view the world a little differently. Um, this uh, presentation is purposely going to be uh, a little provocative. Uh, I'm going to push the boundaries and uh, we'll see where that takes uh, the discussion. The slides that you're about to see, you can download on slideshare.net. Uh, there's the URL. And um, I'm going to uh, just repeat what I, what I said uh, and uh, assume that you didn't hear it, but you certainly didn't see it. Uh, this is the fundamental problem, a polarization of people uh, with um, these attributes from the old minds that have had to make a transition over about 30, 35 years and the new minds who've never known anything other than a world of um, technology uh, and, and the internet. And so uh, over a 35 year period, there's been quite a massive change. Attitudinally, it sees people looking at data and information differently. One, the old mind, it's a question of power and control. The new or the young minds, it's a question of uh, influence and cooperation. And so this gives us some uh, really interesting outcomes. Um, in the old world, you owned your data. It wasn't an awful lot of it, but you guarded it. And uh, if you knew things in a company uh, that no one else knew, it was guarded. It was a means of um, controlling your uh, destiny, if you will. Young people are very open. Uh, they give everything away. Behaviors on social networks, for example, of taking everybody surpri by surprise. Uh, people will tell you the uh, most extraordinary things for a bar of chocolate, uh, as an analogy, and they uh, share within the company and they're much more prone to teamwork. So here's uh, the conundrum that we're, we're up against. You, you go on uh, the internet and uh, you generate uh, through your many actions, lots and lots of data. And that data flows towards the providers of services who then take that data and they process it uh, and they uh, create their data. Getting your information out of there, I would suggest to you is impossible because it's become integrated with the data of thousands uh, of other users. And so, this is the, the, the first big difficulty and um, anybody who thinks that the facts they have about you are either recoverable or destroyable in any way uh, are kidding themselves. Once something's out there on the net, it's not only impossible uh, to get at it or, or destroy it uh, in total. And so the, the plus here, the upside is that the data analysis is to is used to tailor search and services and sales uh, and, and information for us and, and in one level it makes our lives easier uh, on another it's not so good so i just want to give a snapshot of how the heck we got here and what the next steps are and where the wider implication uh, implications are uh, and we're going to do this uh, from this point the world was slow, it was disconnected, and in my lifetime, uh, there were only one billion uh, fixed line telephones. Uh, we've gone more or less back to that state. People, young people are no longer having telephone lines, they have broadband and they use mobile. And 
very swiftly, the population and the traffic has moved to an internet population of about six people. Many of us in the uh, Western world, uh, the wealthier nations, have several devices. That's where the 12 billion devices come from. Um, but we've got something like four, uh, five billion of the world's population now able to get on the internet one way or another. And it is transformative, but there's an even bigger transformation on its way, and it's called the IoT, the Internet of Things. Now this is hard to estimate, but uh, people think that we're going to have 50 to 500 billion connected things. I have a suspicion that that is a gross underestimate. But what goes with this is the degrees of freedom or separation. <clears throat> so with the telephone, there are about seven degrees of uh, separation. Uh, with the, uh, the mobile and the internet, it goes down rapidly. And by the time we get to the IoT, there's only about two things between each of us. We're now going to be so very close because everything we own will be connected to something. Now, the way the networks look, <coughs> excuse me, like this, this is the old tree and branch network for the telephone. Uh, we knew that people would make three, four, five phone calls a day of three or four minutes. It was easy to uh, uh, design and engineer because we could do it mathematically. And um, it resulted in um, uh, statistics like this. We, we have a, a domination of, uh, um, of traffic, uh, wireline phone, fax, and, uh, and just a bit of a telex. And so uh, the mobile network was essentially just glued on top, uh, replacing some fixed lines, uh, towers spanning quite large areas. And this was being quite transformative, being able to communicate on the, on, on the move, has seen more services and um, more activity, and the activities got shorter and much more of it. So uh, texting transformed the switch network because we went from three or four calls, of three or four minutes to hundreds of messages of a few seconds duration. Uh, that caused absolute mayhem in the network design, and we can't actually model that very well. But this is where the internet is, and um, this is beyond our ability, not only to mathematically model, it, uh, even to computer model. It is changing fast. We have not got a good characterization of what people do, and the degrees of freedom to communicate and do things is absolutely vast and grows every day. So this is um, retrospective. We, you make a good guess, build the network and hope. That's the engineering reality. So the net traffic is interesting. Uh, about 50% of it is on Wi-Fi um, and um, about 45% is on wire or fiber, but only about 5% is actually mobile as in 345G. Um, so the proponents, for example, of 5G who say all the IoT is going to be on IOG, uh, 5G, no it won't. 5G will dominate the whole of the communication sphere and provide all the broadband, no it won't. It cannot deliver what's on the 10. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the limitations, uh, in China, uh, some of the mobile 5G towers are consuming 5 kilowatts. Uh, they are looking at 10 uh, uh, and 20 kilowatts. Uh, now think of the number of towers you require and work out the number of power stations. In UK terms, we would have to build two nuclear power stations to power up a full 5G network. That's not going to happen. So for the next 30, 50 years and so, we are going to have a very mixed uh, communications uh, landscape. So let's just have a look at the, uh, the social connection map. This is an interesting little video. These clusters <clears throat> are clusters of information or interest where people are being grouped. 
So this is a not a topological map. Uh, map. It is a, 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 a grouping map of connectivity. And I call these the rabbit holes of cordiality. Uh, people cluster together with people who agree with them. And this is both useful and dangerous. And you see, in it, see it in its most dangerous form with the far right in the United States and their belief system, because everybody's saying the same thing, it becomes the truth. On a positive side, uh, this is terrific for uh, helping people with medical difficulties or social difficulties uh, and many other aspects of life. So this is uh, now amplified when we look at how the IoT is going to appear. Um, absolutely, you have to start thinking now, instead of networks being planar, flat like a tabletop, but being three dimensional. They're on every level of every skyscraper, um, they're in things that are flying, they're in things on the ground, in cars, uh, it will be in our food, medical industries, uh, in our logistic industries uh, and uh, absolutely uh, everywhere. Uh, this is uh, really uh, extremely uh, transformative and uh, will make uh, uh, the control of information really quite uh, impossible. So here are some emergent behaviours of the IoT. So a surprising fact, the vast majority of things on the IoT will never actually connect to the internet. They will talk to each other in clusters like this. So you have to imagine all the appliances in your office talking to each other, or all the components in your car talking to each other, or all your medical devices talking to each other. And occasionally the aggregated information gets onto the net, but that might be at your behest rather than the machines. So this is a very different view to the, the one that you will see at large from the, uh, the mobile industry, for example. So how the heck did we get here? We've gone through a series of industrial revolutions that have uh, built one on another uh, with uh, various ma machines uh, and devices. And uh, we've been able to feed, clothe, house more and more people, uh, the um, the duration of people's lives, their standard of living, everything has improved, but at the cost of the planet. We have done this by burning, destroying raw materials and causing vast amounts of uh, pollution. And so Industry 4.0 is our first big step into moving to solutions that are sustainable and they are absolutely dependent on new materials created by bio and nanotech, artificial intelligence uh, and robotics. And it's really about reducing the destruction uh, of natural materials, uh, getting far better performance for less energy, less waste, less friction and new capabilities. And so the nervous system of the planet now becomes the IoT. That's what it actually is. It's giving us a means of monitoring, controlling, uh, finding things, uh, looking at uh, their life, improving them and making sure that we can reasonably reuse, repurpose and recycle in a way that we cannot do today. So um, the IoT is going to be the most impacting on telecoms and uh, networks. So here's a good example. Uh, of a modern vehicle uh, where every item is actually tagged. Uh, the items talk to each other on a network. The information on the network is aggregated and sometimes it's uh, uploaded into the network for the use of the manufacturer uh, or, or the garage. And the channels are 3, 4, 5G of course, but with Wi-Fi, but there's also car to car communications coming along as well. So this is a, a very different picture taking it to your smart home and we start with the tagging of food, uh, our medicines, um, our body monitoring and medical devices and uh, our exercise, everything we do. And the final data comes from uh, the Japanese style toilet 
that actually uh, characterizes and analyzes the, uh, the output from our bodies. This is the complete medical package uh, for keeping well and fit. If we go and have a look at all our appliances uh, in house and office, uh, they will talk to each other, will talk uh, onto the net when required, but the key thing they will do is become a part of the design loop. Our activities will say we do not want the, the 39 options on the washing machine, we only use four, and there will be lots of things of that nature that um, can, can be fed back uh, into design teams and, and it's what is actually now missing. Every design team has got everything apart from the user or, or the customer and a lot of information about what people actually do and what they actually want. And increasingly, AI is entering this sphere um, and it is, for example, designing the chips in your mobile phone and it's starting to play a part in designing uh, physical uh, objects too. If anything, if, if anything I could say about AI, it is that it is the most powerful way of uh, recognizing patterns and learning that we have ever uh, constructed. So here's a, a very simple example. Uh, the global energy demand is just keeping going up and up and up. Uh, we can reduce uh, that total demand with smart technologies. And for the uh, producers of energy, uh, like all networks, the killer is the um, uh, the peak to mean uh, demand or, or, or the base load to peak. And um, if we could get our appliances to demand energy when it was available uh, and not create these peaks, we would need less power stations. We would have far less waste of uh, energy and, and everything would become uh, uh, more uh, uh, efficient. So realizing sustainable societies uh, is not easy. Um, to give you a, a very simple quote, there are absolutely no simple solutions to complex problems. And what we face on this planet are a raft of really complex problems, and they're going to need uh, multi-pronged approaches, and the approaches themselves are going to be quite sophisticated. But I happen to think that we're, we're getting there by degree, sometimes intended, uh, sometimes not. So just for fun, uh, I thought I'd uh, do a quick calculation for you to just have a look at how much uh, our data uh, is when, as we, we live, where it starts and where it finishes. So uh, it really starts from the pregnancy test. At that point, your data uh, itinerary begins and uh, probably the next big uh, piece of information is, is the first uh, scan that mother has and it's a series of fair pictures. Uh, that documentation of your life just escalates right through your childhood, right through your career, old age, until somebody's reading your last will and testament, and that's the last piece of data by and large. There may be some press cuttings and a few other things, and of course your friends and family will remember you, but really the generation of information by you uh, really tells off to more or less zero at that point. And uh, what does that entail? Um, for you and I, it's of the order of two petabytes of data. Um, alongside that, the, the, the institutions, machines and companies create a further raft of data uh, of, of about um, a couple of three or a couple of terabytes, something of that uh, order. That's it. So, um, but that amount is growing faster because of our means of generating the amount of video, the amount of photographic images, uh, the amount of data that we each generate is going up uh, every single year. It's almost doubling uh, year on year. And uh, this is uh, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, so what have we actually done um, in the crudest sense? Uh, we've outsourced trust. We've uh, used all of these uh, applications and uh, we've used all these services and each one we've given a little data and um, the data we've given has been quite overt. What has been covert is our behaviours. 
how long did we watch? What did we watch? What did we purchase? When did we purchase it? Um, what's our complete history of purchases? What games do we play? And so on. We don't even know we're generating that data, but it is uh, quite valuable and there's an awful lot of it. So the deep analysis of this stuff is uh, what matters. And so um, we are looking at uh, just this this uh, simple graph, this simple picture. This is uh, what do you view? And uh, when you view and how many people do the same thing? And so this is the sort of uh, producer, the progeny, if you like, of that message you get. Um, people who watch this video also like these and you'll get a long list of videos that puts you in a bracket of other users uh, by some kind of segmentation as indicated on the left, produced by some kind of analysis indicated on the right. By the way, human beings don't look at this stuff. Uh, the machines sort it out and we get categorized. And um, I have to say it all starts off with a guess, but the more and more data that the machines get, uh, the more and more accurate that um, uh, prediction, if you like, or, or um, uh, offer uh, becomes. So the trust, I think we have to explain, is not something that you can necessarily depend upon. Um, it comes in several forms. And um, the one that uh, is confounding people now uh, is, is the human uh, machine network. Uh, and with the IoT, it's going to be all the machine trust what are they going to give away? Uh, can we actually control it? And uh, the answer is unlikely. Uh, another feature of trust uh, is uh, it is very often asymmetric. Um, you can afford people great trust, but they don't reflect it and give it to you. One of the most interesting features of the internet is the blind trust that people will afford, uh, the Amazons, the Googles, the PayPals, and so on. Um, principally because these boys are very, very big. They can't uh, afford to fail. Uh, they are being judged all the time by their user groups. Uh, they uh, do not want to see bad press. It would not be a good idea for them to do something bad. It would be visible very, very quickly. So this is in contrast to, shall we say, a conventional high street bank where they can uh, uh, upset you but you've got no voice virtually but uh, on the on the net that is different but you know I, I always think of um, ethics and honesty uh, and trust as, as being uh, something that's actually uh, really slow to accumulate uh, you can lose it in a second and uh, you might not be able to repair it so I pulled the poll for you and uh, <laughs> it's interesting now who people trust. I have to say that the trust in uh, scientists and uh, medics has rocketed uh, with COVID. There is uh, still everywhere in the world uh, a lot of um, doubters and people who do not want to join in the vaccination plan. And um, I can't really say too much about that, uh, but I think uh, Mr. Darwin is standing in the uh, wings waiting to sort that out for them. Um, you can't make people do things, um, but what uh, is interesting is how this graph varies uh, with countries. Uh, the United States um, principally, I think because of the poor level of general education, um, the um, extreme views held by uh, a lot of people uh, on uh, the internet as uh, actually got some grave difficulties that uh, most of the societies do not. There's also uh, have to remember that there is an information war uh, being pursued by uh, rogue nations who are planting uh, false information uh, and, and that clouds the whole issue of, of trust. So the paradox for me is most people will trust Facebook and Twitter out of hand without a question. Um, and I now think that um, a lot of the time 
people are more willing to uh, believe Mary on uh, Facebook than they are to uh, believe a scientist or, or a doctor. It is a, a strange occurrence. So here's the uh, concatenated trust that people don't see, uh, the various levels. Uh, you have to remember that when we think we're working human to human, uh, we have in the way uh, networks and machines and very often other people and applications. And so uh, the perceived trust and the actual trust uh, are very, very different. And uh, the bigger the network becomes and the bigger uh, the number of loops, uh, then uh, the weaker the actual trust. And But humans are the primary failure mechanism always. And uh, we are our own uh, protectors. Uh, we actually own the situation. So let's just have a quick look at data protection. And um, it, it's a tremendous uh, mechanism for avoiding work. It feeds the uh, paranoid. And so far, in my view, uh, the legal efforts have proved uh, totally ineffective. Uh, I'll give you two examples. On the day of the introduction of the Data Protection Act in the UK, I received an email from a British government minister uh, with 350 email uh, addresses uh, in uh, uh, copied in that I could see. On the day of GDPR launch, uh, a similar thing happened with um, uh, an MEP. Uh, who actually got 500 people uh, copied into uh, an email. And um, I want to give you a prequel now uh, of what comes next and um, why it's going to get uh, difficult. And the reality is we have little or no clue to even look where our information is. And uh, we've given away a lot and we do it because of the return on investment. We give a little information and our perception is we get a lot back. And so here is, uh, I think, uh, the best condensation of the situation I, I can come up with. And I think that every attempt to limit, control and guard, protect data uh, has actually uh, failed and it's failed spectacularly. So to be brutally honest, the big co companies uh, salute all of these uh, regulations or at least pay lip service to them. Uh, a lot of the small companies are either ignorant, lax, or, or they don't give a fig, and uh, Joe Public just ignores it uh, or is completely unaware. And, and that, I think, is the reality. The worst aspect is the cyber criminals just love it. They're able to take this as an opportunity. It's a terrific criminal space, and they feed off the confusion using these laws. Uh, to extract data they need. So the summary is this is observed by the big uh, a big organization, but very often it's, it's neglected or totally ignored by the employees. Uh, and that goes uh, uh, very often unchecked despite all the uh, training sessions. It's very unworkable in a highly innovative uh, environment and it just kills uh, new business uh, creation. And so I don't see a solution uh, for the future that we're creating. So I, I look at these data protection acts in terms of uh, about as useful as copyright. And that came from a world of the printing press and paper. And so um, I'm just going to close now with a couple of uh, slides and uh, so this are the two boundaries for living. You can be isolated or you can be connected. And uh, that's the extreme. And um, if you try to keep information secret, it's like trying to nail a jelly to a tree. The paranoid are now very, very hard to employ, but they still give away a lot of uh, information. The old, uh, maybe internet uh, active, blissfully unaware. The technophile gamers, they run every risk on the planet, but they generally know what they're doing. Those are, that's the landscape of the user. And <laughs> I'm not quite sure who this is, but this is how a lot of people feel, but it's your call. 
You choose how you want to live on or off the grid, and you have to take responsibility for it. And so the mindset has to be, what do I get and what am I risking? And I would suggest to you that reputation is the biggest thing at risk. So don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, don't have a cloud account, have three, three different users, three different continents, spread your material out. If you're really paranoid, blockchain it uh, across all three. There is no such thing as a risk-free life. Uh, the, the, these uh, bullet points come from my laws of uh, cybercrime. It's quite simply that um, you uh, have to be more than alert, but you have to put in as much protection as you can. Finally, just remember, the great purpose here is to establish through industry 4.0 and then 5.0 sustainable uh, societies. Uh, and this is far more a political uh, and social problem than it is uh, engineering. So thank you for listening. Uh, that uh, is the end of my slide. Again, uh, my material is available to you on uh, this website and uh, you can get this presentation either through this website or just look for me on uh, SlideShare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cochrane. Thank you for the insightful presentation uh, we have uh, been listening to, and we're looking forward to the interactions in the questions and answer session. Certainly, uh, there's a quotation I, I have taken from you that says, there are absolutely no simple solutions to uh, complex uh, problems. Certainly, uh, we are living in that world, and we thank you for your time. Um, Without any further ado, let me hand over now to Prof. Berry to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Cochran. That was such food for thought, a uh, lot to reflect on. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Derek Keats. And unfortunately, Derek uh, couldn't join the, the call because he had problems connecting to the platform, but he did record a um, uh, his presentation and we'll play it for you and I hope he joins us during the Q&A. So um, if we could um, uh, begin the presentation. So hello everyone, I'm Derek Keats and uh, I'm here as part of the sixth webinar hosted by NetBank, JCSE at Wits University and EE Business Intelligence. Uh, the webinar is all about living in a connected world. Who owns my data and why should I care? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about who owns your data and why you should care. So let's get started. So first of all, who am I? I um, am a former biology professor. I was a biology professor for uh, some 15 years and uh, um, during that time, I also had a strong interest in technology and I eventually moved into university man management and I spent 10 years responsible for IT in two universities. Um, the last one being Wits University. Um, I left there and I started uh, consulting and working with some fintech startups and I've been doing that uh, work with fintechs now for nine years. Um, I'm currently part of a business called Ono Connect. Uh, we are uh, a unified uh, payment business focused on small merchants primarily, uh, but we're not merchant facing. We uh, do the processing on behalf of uh, uh, payment processors that are uh, focused on, on, on smaller merchants. And you may know us as the uh, back end engine behind uh, Yoko Payments, which is the largest. Um, a payment um, organization in South Africa focused on small merchants. That's where I come from. And in that organization, one of my responsibilities uh, lies in the area of uh, compliance, and that includes cybersecurity compliance and compliance to uh, the various things that have to be done in a financial technology organization. So with that uh, background, let's look at your data and, and where it's created. So anytime you do anything on social media, you're creating data. Anytime you go visit a healthcare practitioner, you are creating data. 
anytime you use Google Maps and use it to drive your car, um, you are creating data or walk around for that matter, you're creating data. If you do any banking, you're creating data. If you travel, especially air travel, you are creating data. If you're watching Netflix or some other uh, online uh, source of entertainment, you are creating data. In fact, everything that you do that involves any kind of computing device with an internet connection creates data from you and from the activities that you engaged in. So if we're going to talk about ownership of data, we need to understand what ownership means. And this may seem a little crazy uh, that I would be saying we need to understand what ownership means, right? Everybody understands what ownership means. I own this little device I have in my hand, and that's what ownership is. But it's not quite that simple. So let's just look at it from the basic principles first. So ownership means holding exclusive rights and control over an asset, an object, land, real estate, or the expression of an idea, the so-called intellectual property. Now, an asset is usually referred to as property, hence the concept of intellectual property. And it's obviously easier to understand when you're thinking about physical property like a house. Um, we all know what it means to own a house. And, but actually ownership is actually expressed in terms of the rights of the owner with respect to the asset that is his or her property. And ownership is a human construct. It's not something that exists in nature. It's a human con uh, construct that is typically codified in, in law, and it would not exist without either some sort of social or legal uh, boundaries that are set in terms of uh, the ownership of assets. So keep all those things in mind. So I'm going to use copyright as an example because I think everybody's got some sort of familiarity with copyright. So ownership is usually expressed in terms of multiple rights in, in copyright and other forms of ownership as well. So in copyright, the rights include uh, the right to protection under the law. Um, so if someone takes your work and goes and publish it and claims it as their own, you have a recourse. You have a right to produce copies and sell them or give them away. Uh, whatever you want to do. You have uh, a right to control the conditions under which people use um, your, your copyrighted materials. Um, you have a right to create derivative works. So if you write a book and um, somebody wants to make a movie of it, they can't just take your book and go make a movie. Uh, they have to get your permission and that usually typically involves paying some money. Um, you have a right for the import or export of, uh, of your work. Um, you have a right to transmit it by electronic means. You have a right of performance or display. So if you write a poem, somebody can't just get on TV and read it uh, without your permission. Um, and you have the right of attribution. That means that um, someone uses your material, they have to say it's yours, they have to associate it with some way. And you have a right to sell or cede some or all rights to other people. What I typically do, I'm a photographer, so what I typically do with my photos is I give them away, but I require attribution. I'm able to do that because there are licenses that make use of these, tip, uh, these particular rights of copyright. Now, of course, copyright is not exactly the same in all jurisdictions. There's considerable ge uh, geographical variation in um, both the, the, the copyright law and how it's applied. Um, but in principle, these are the uh, rights that that are included in owning copyright. These rights define ownership. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. We're going to move on and talk about limitations on ownership. So ownership can have limitations and it can have moral responsibilities. So copyright, for example, may be limited by the doctrine of fair use. So fair use doctrine means I can take, for example, a short um, excerpt from um, a Trevor Noah YouTube video and then use it to parody it or to um, create a criticism or analysis of it. And I don't need any particular permissions to do that. 
although it's not the same necessarily in all jurisdictions that, that um, copyright can expire or usually expires after a set period, and this again varies geographically. Um, land ownership as another uh, form of ownership can have restrictions on the ownership to allow people free passage. Uh, so for example, if I live in Canada and I build a cabin by a river, I can't put up a fence and block access to the river. In South Africa, I can. So those, those uh, particular uh, restrictions can uh, vary geographically. Uh, ownership may be appropriated for the public good. So own land um, and a road needs to cut across the corner of your land, uh, that land can be appropriated. You may be paid or you may not be paid depending on the jurisdiction. So these are some of the ways in which ownership can have limitations and carry with it moral responsibilities. Okay, so having said all of that, thinking back to the rights inherent in copyright and the notion of limitations and moral responsibilities, um, let's look at the physical world and the digital world and see how they're different. So there are two types of entities. There are rivalrous entities. <clears throat> These are things that can't be in pla two places at once. The physical things like my glass here, um, things like my, my, my cell phone here, or as in the case of the image here, uh, like my car. So if I park my car um, in the Karoo as I did here, and I go walking to look for birds, and you come along and you jump in my car, turn on the ignition and drive off in it, you've stolen it. It can't be in two places at once. You can't have it at the same time as I have it. You have it, I own it, you've stolen it, unless I've loaned it to you, of course. So that's, a, that's the nature of rival in, in, uh, entities, rivalrous entities. And most physical things are rivalrous entities. You can't have them uh, at, you know, two people can't have them at the same time. There are some physical entities like the atmosphere, for example, where uh, which are probably closer to being non-rivalrous uh, since we don't package up the atmosphere and sell it to people to breathe, although that may come one of these days. Um, so non-rivalrous entities can be in more than one place at the same time, and they're all obviously mostly typically in uh, digital format. So my photograph of this amazing grass hull here, um, you know, it can be in thousands of places at the same time and having it in a thousand places doesn't necessarily inherently cause me any harm unless of course i wanted to sell it and i wanted to retain all copyright and somebody took it and used it then they would be violating one of the rights earned in my copyright but if i've given away the copyright except for the those two restrictions that i mentioned um then it doesn't it doesn't do me any harm if it's in a million places um, and it can be in a million places at once. So rivalrous entities are familiar and this is the kind of ownership that we typically think about when we're thinking about owning things. But non-rivalrous entities are mostly, we're not familiar with thinking of ownership in relation to these non-rivalrous uh, entities. You know, traditionally, copyright would have been a physical, would have been manifest in a physical thing, a book or a magazine. Uh, but today, of course, copyright also applies to digital non-rivalrous entities. Makes it a little more complicated than it used to be in the old days. Okay, so taking those two entities in mind, where does data fit? Well, data, of course, is non-rivalrous. So, Let's think about what ownership means in relation to your data. So, as I said, data is intrinsically a non-rivalrous entity. Uh, ownership's only meaningful where it's defined in law and the law is enforced. There can be social conventions that also define ownership, but for all intents and purposes in the modern world, ownership is only meaningful where it is defined in law and where that law is Forced, and it's defined in terms of rights. Now, until recently, you asked me, what does ownership mean in relation to your data? I would have said, I have no idea. But in the last few years, um, 
we've been able to answer this question because uh, countries have developed legislation, um, data privacy and data protection legislation um, that defines certain rights uh, that the originator of uh, the person about whom the data is concerned hold. And those rights partially define ownership of your data. Perfect, but you can consider um, that those rights are basically what it means because there aren't any other rights that are explicitly defined in RINA. So there is a tricky challenge with data, with your personal data, because on the one side, on the one side, sorry about that, on the one side, um, there is the consideration of privacy or privacy is like getting them mixed up since I have a North American accent living in South Africa, but let's call it privacy. So on the left hand side here, you've got privacy. On the right hand side, you've got functionality and convenience. Now you can't have um, perfect privacy and lots of functionality and convenience in most circumstances that involve data. So usually you're going to give up some control of your data in exchange for which you're going to gain some functionality or convenience. That's the conventional view. Um, so you might give up your street address, for example, in order to be able to do banking but you would probably not give up your street address to be able to play a game on Steam or something like that. You might give up your phone number in order to be able to chat with your friends so that they could find you on WhatsApp or um, Telegram or Signal or whatever app you're, you're on. You would be willing to probably allow someone to access the phone number in order to make that chat connection. You might give up your email address in order to participate in a social network. But the question then becomes what happens to those data once they have been used? Okay, so I mentioned the data uh, privacy and data protection. Um, so the um, UK, sorry, the EU, um, the European Union has introduced legislation a couple of years ago called the General Data Protection Regulation, um, the GDPR. This is very well known uh, in in terms of uh, data data protection and the requirements that exist in relation to someone who's going to obtain and process your data. And in South Africa, we have um, this year, or, uh, actually last year, um, come into force the Protection of Personal Information Act, or POPIA as it's known. Uh, POPIA and GDPR are pretty similar. There's, a, there's almost a 100% overlap between the two with some notable exceptions, but in general, um, we can consider them to be similar. So I'm going to talk about rights uh, from the GDPR, um, which I'm a little bit more familiar with because it's been around for longer, and the business I work with is actually registered in the Netherlands, which is why I say I live in Johannesburg and work in Amsterdam. So in the GDPR, there are two key role players, the data subject, so that's you, and the data controller, which is the, the entity who is accessing and going to do something with data. So if you go open a bank account, the data controller will be the bank. If you, look, if you sign up for Facebook, then uh, Facebook will be the data controller. So your rights are defined with respect to a given data controller. And data controllers may also use data processors to further process the data, and a data processor might use another one and another one and another one and so on. Um, so it becomes quite complicated, which is one of the reasons why um, this is, you know, except in exceptional cases, this is a difficult uh, law to enforce. Um, and with Papia, the data controller is called the responsible party and, and the data processor is called the operator. But I've heard legal people using those interchangeably as if calling the data calling it a data controller, even though they're talking about pop uh, calling it a data processor. Because people I think are more familiar with the um are popular being much more recent. 
So what are the ownership rights that you are granted, granted um, in and GDPR and other other related uh, legislations. One is the right to information. So if someone has information about you, you should be able to know what information they have and what they're doing with it. You have uh, a right to rectification, which means if, if, if they have information about you and something is wrong, like maybe they have your address wrong or maybe they spilled your first name wrong, you have a right to uh, correct that and ensure that it is correct when the data are further process. Um, you have a right to access the data, straightforward. You, you, if you've given consent, you have a right to withdraw consent. Um, consent is a, is a whole kettle of fish that worth a, worth a webinar on its own. And you have the right to object to uh, you know, what, what the people are doing with the data. Sorry, there's a mosquito. And uh, you have a right to object to what people are doing with the data. If they're processing it in ways that you didn't agree with, you can um, you can object to that. Um, and you have a right to object to automated processing. So that's an interesting one because it, it applies to certain situations. Like if you imagine, if you apply for insurance, for example, and, and an automated system um, does some calculations, runs an algorithm and turns you down, you have a right to go and say, um, I demand that um, a human intervene here and have a look at my application because something's gone wrong. Data process. This isn't the you that this is fine. And you have a right to be forgotten. <clears throat> this is a very important right. So that means that you have a right to tell whoever has your data to delete all of it. Now, this right is ob obviously not absolute uh, because if it was, I would go to the bank and I would get a house uh, loan and then I would uh, tell the bank. Um, I want to be forgotten. Uh, well, obviously, I, the bank isn't going to forget me until I've paid back my loan, and they may not even forget me then, but um, for, for other reasons. Also, so this is not an absolute right, but if you um, want to have your account deleted on Facebook, for example, you, you can do so, and you have that right to that everything is deleted, but it doesn't always work. So if you go on, to, if you look at the recent uh, clamor uh, of people leaving WhatsApp, um, you can you have a right to be forgotten, so you can delete your account and all your account data will be deleted. But everything you've, all the interactions you've had with other people will still exist on their uh, on their accounts. And to me, this is a violation of the GDPR. I don't know how they get away with it, but uh, one of these days they're going they're going to get hit penalty there. Um, and then you have a right to data portability. Typically, this means you, you you can get your data somehow. It might be pr a printout, or it might be on a on a memory stick, or it might be downloadable from a website. Doesn't necessarily mean that you can you can import it into some other system. But we'll come to that in a minute with with respect to banking. And then Papia has the interesting um, uh, aspect to it that it includes and covers all juristic persons, not just human beings. So companies, universities, societies, any kind of organization, all have the same rights defined um, under Papia. Uh, at the moment, as far as I know, there's only two countries in the world that include juristic persons in all juristic persons in um, their data protection record. So why should you care? That's what we're, we're here to talk about. Why should you care about ownership of your data? So if you're a data subject, is your personally identifiable information secure in the hands of the data controller? Do you know what they're doing with it? We've had some significant breaches in South Africa, uh, one last year that, it, that involved uh, um, a company that does um, Betting for, for loans, uh, credit ratings, and things like that on behalf of banks was breached, and a number of, uh, uh, of um, banks had uh, prominent data exposed. And so your data can end up in the wrong hands. Are you happy with that? What could be the result? You know, at the simple end, you could be a victim of some kind of marketing scam. So someone's got your phone number, they know a little bit about you, they call you up and say, hey, I'm from Vodacom or I'm from NetBank or whatever. And typically they're not there. They can hear 
marketers and they're trying to sell you something, the most of the time you actually something that you need. So you can be a victim of a, of a marketing uh, thing, but that's probably uh, you know. I don't like it, but it's it's not necessarily too harmful compared to some of the other things. You know, you could receive spam. That's another thing. If someone's got your email address, you could be a victim of scam. So someone could, you know, having learned something about you through the data that's been leaked, um, call you up and say, "Hey, I I hear you've uh, bought some Bitcoin. Um, I, I've got a really good deal on on Ethereum, and uh, you're going to make more money than you ever make on on Bitcoin." Then you go and you invest and they take your money and run away. All of these things can happen if your data is not safe, if safe. Um, your, your reputation can be harmed. I know a couple of friends of mine had their accounts hacked on Facebook. Um, the hacker sent out um, um, videos. Those videos were actually linked to um, sites um, that probably most people wouldn't want to have, go and have a look at. And that person's reputation, if they didn't know that they can't listen, that person's reputation was harmed. Um, then there's phishing. You know, phishing is, a, is, is usually where most uh, contemporary cyber attacks begin. Um, you know, someone sends you an email and says, click this link to do something, and then you go to log in and they capture your password, and then they've got your username and password on some account, and then they can get in, they can do other other nasty stuff if, if in, once they're inside your systems. And the Twitter, the big Twitter breach of last year where the accounts of some prominent people were exposed uh, was, ex, uh, you know, it started with a phishing scam and employees of Twitter fell for it, the, heck, uh, the attackers got inside uh, Twitter and were able to get access to other things once they were inside using that person's account detail. And then there's identity theft, where someone pretends to be you, signs up for some service, takes out a, as happened to a friend of mine, bid um, on higher purchase, and then disappears. And then somebody comes looking for you and you have no idea about this bid, but someone is impersonated. And those identity theft things can take an enormous amount of time and effort um, to get out of once you're stuck in one of them. You don't want this to happen. So as a data subject, you want to be sure that your data is protected. You want to be sure that the people that are processing your data are doing it in such a way that it's not exposed to malicious uh, things. If you're a data controller, <coughs> excuse me, well, it's the law. And you're required to protect personally identifiable information under law, oh, under GDPR and POPIA and many other uh, related uh, legislation around the world. Um, you must keep it secure at all times, so that means you must have good cybersecurity place, and you must follow uh, good, solid, modern cybersecurity practices, keeping systems updated, no trust, and all of those great things which I could talk about for hours. Um, you must also comply with data privacy and protection regulations, including the rights of the data subject as defined in regulations. And in most jurisdictions, the fine for non-compliance, fines for non-compliance are massive. In South Africa, it's 10 million rand. Um, in other jurisdictions like the, the EU for the GPR, it is significantly more than that. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, to just um, say that was a recording of Derek's presentation and uh, we will post the full presentation soon. So for those of you who want to um, uh, to see it, we will uh, make it available. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Nilesh uh, Mulji um, and uh, he's got a very interesting title and in running these webinars, I've learned quite a lot about uh, corporate titles. So, um, in fact, Nilesh's title is Nedbank Group Privacy Information Officer. Uh, he's been at Nedbank for four and a half years. Uh, he's um, successfully run the privacy program at Nedbank uh, that um, established the uh, privacy as 
business as usual at the bank. He has also held a privacy role within um, another bank, APSA, and he's got 10 years of privacy experience within the financial services industry. Prior to, um, to joining the banks, um, he was an, um, a security consultant and an IT auditor with a PwC for six years, where he gained experience in several industries within South Africa. He's got a BSc degree in information technology and um, um, a cybersecurity diploma from the University of Johannesburg. So if I can hand over to Nilesh Mulji. Thank you, Nilesh. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I think whenever I hear the amount of years that I've been working, kind of just reminds me that I am getting a little bit older. Uh, so thank you for that. I think um, as an IPO of a big bank, I think um, we start off, off our privacy journey quite early, and it was well, well into kind of the popular still being a bull, and. What we actually went through was realizing that the privacy journey is definitely a long one, uh, in some cases extremely challenging. But for me, I think it was extremely rewarding based on the fact that I was protecting the information or the personal information of, of clients, um, of myself. I think I, I, I bank with, with NetBank, my folks bank with them. So it was a little bit, a little bit selfish, but it was that was the kind of rewarding element behind that. I think today's today's talk is pretty much about some of the the practicalities behind Papia. So, so I think Derek did a great job of, of talking about some of the principles at a high level. But what do those principles actually mean? And hopefully, my talk today will kind of give you guys a better sense of of what organizations need to consider when complying with privacy. Um, Derek also pointed out that privacy kind of fundamentally changes the way many organizations conduct business. I think if you think about the fact that organizations collect information, they process information, they store information, uh, and they need to dispose of information, those practices may or may not have been in play previously. So, so, so privacy kind of fundamentally impacts those aspects of of business. I, I think also early in my in my privacy career, um, it was quite important for us not to use the big stick approach. So you you will do this and you must do that. It was pretty much or it pretty much boiled down to a very collaborative approach. So we had to engage group HR, group procurement, the information security officer, group compliance, and even and even group uh, internal order. I think the combined the combined collaboration between those various elements makes a privacy program and the implementation of some of the privacy requirements that much easier. So as I said earlier, um, I'm gonna take you through, through um, kind of the practicalities behind that. And I think if you are a NetBank client, I, hopefully it gives you some kind of warm and fuzzy feelings that, that we do take the protection of personal information Seriously, uh, Johnny, next slide, please. So I'm not too sure if you guys can. OK, there we go. So 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 good privacy is good business. And I think that was one of our our, our selling points when we ran the program. I think if you think about the business of banking. Business of banking is based on trust. I mean, people trust that the bank will look after your money. People will trust that they will ensure that your money, I mean, that your information is properly protected. It will ensure that the bank makes the best possible decisions about your investments. So all of that kind of is, is based on trust and, and good privacy is good business kind of does highlight the fact that privacy can be an enabler of, of, of business. Um, the evolution of, of banking, um, I think Professor Cochrane highlighted the fact that the world is changing. And in order for, for 
the world to change, there are a number of other moving parts that also need to change. I think if, if you had to ask my dad, who is 76 year, years old, his idea of a bank is still very much a brick and mortar establishment, wherein he would go to the bank and fill out those deposit forms and all of those cool things. And he still doesn't use a, an app. Um, the bank of the future is, is very different. I mean, 10, 10 years ago, who would have ever thought that your bank, whichever one it may be, might be a, a tool wherein you buy airtime, lotto tickets, um, electricity, all of those things. And, and, the, and the bank of the future is definitely going to be a lifestyle enabler. So um, it will be that service provider that provides you with a kind of br a very broad product product base and, and, and will give an opportunity to enable your livelihoods. So the question that I get asked the most, if I could say, is, is where do we actually start with our privacy journey or what do we need to consider when we embarking on our, on our journey? And, and, and the image that I have um, of, of the lighthouse is, is something quite symbolic within the NetBank privacy office. And, and the reason why we have it is we chose that symbol as being our, uh, our image. So you would see it on all our letterhead, you'd see it on all our, on, on any comms that we would send out. The image of the lighthouse kind of depicts um, stormy seas. Stormy seas can be created by all sorts of things, economic changes, pandemics, uh, changes to, to business strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the lighthouse becomes the privacy office that guides guides business through that those those crazy times. And I suppose the lighthouse is a very strong, strong structure. Um, and it's always present. I think uh, the guiding the ships into the harbors or ports is pretty much what privacy aims to do when they are tough times. So, Janika, next slide, please. So, where do we start? Um, the right governance. Um, and, and, and when we talk about governance, it's policies, it's standards, it's target operating models, it's, it's tools and processes. I think the important part here is to make your policy as digestible as possible. And when I say digestible, I'm actually referring to the fact that it should be easy to understand and easy to read. The last thing we want is a 30 page privacy policy that goes into super detail on all the kind of provisions that staff need to consider and they don't understand anything. Our policy is extremely short. It's, 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 it's extremely to the point. Um, the standard below that talks to talks to the to the lower level detail of, of the privacy policy. And below that, we have a target operating model. And the target operating model does assist organizations define specific roles and responsibilities within an organization that talks to privacy. So who needs to be involved when there is a new product that needs to be provided or, or, or rolled out? Which role needs to be involved when a third party needs to be assisted? So a very detailed target oper operating model makes, makes a privacy program or, or a privacy office um, much more scalable and, and understandable when it comes to, to, to certain activities. The last thing you want is for organizations to kind of have to go through debates and discussions around whose responsibility is whose. Um, the next point, and I think uh, is, is very dear to my heart, um, and that's change management. I think very early in, in, in my privacy kind of career, I, I realized the importance of change management. And, and, and we spoke about the fact that privacy can fundamentally change how people do certain things. And in my view, change management is kind of that ticket or that boarding pass for staff to kind of join you on that journey. And if you don't give them that, that ticket or that boarding pass, they will be left, around, uh, left behind. Make your change management fun. Make it extremely, extremely interactive and engaging. The last people, the last thing staff want are long, long emails 
that they're not going to read anyways. So make it fun, make it regular, make it targeted. If you've identified certain kind of specific areas in your business, target them. Make sure that your comms outline certain things that, that they do and that you can kind of make it easier for them to understand what we're aiming for. I think also behind change management, regularly test your change management plan. I think it's all fine and well that we do all these cool things, but is it really working? Um, and if you have suitable tests around how you manage or, or how, how successful your change management plan was, then awesome. One thing that we did do, and I think working from home did impact hugely on, on many of the change plans that we did have, but initially we thought about how a staff member enters the building. And, and from the time when they drive into the building, there's a boom, there's a boom that goes up. Um, we could have put privacy messages on the boom. We could have put privacy messages in the canteen on the serviette. So, so think far and wide about cool things that you can do with your messages. Work from home, as I said, has introduced a, a lot of complexity. Um, but think of cool, cool videos, cool infographics. How do you make your message digestible or, and, and easy to kind of comprehend uh, when the guys are at home. Third party management is a huge one and just kind of trends across most privacy incidents across the world have, have resulted in third party management. I mean, you can have the best controls in your environment, but if you are sharing information with a third party that may not have the same level of control that you do, you are asking for, for trouble. Um, so third party management is key. Engage with your group procurement functions, engage with group legal, make sure that you have privacy specific clauses embedded into your, into your onboarding um, processes. So when you onboard a, a, a third party, make sure that you have the clauses in play. Make sure that you perform proper due diligence. And I think third parties, I've read a few articles where third parties have been complaining that they are kind of, due diligence to the nth degree. I think make your, your third party assessments easy. The last thing you want is a very complicated third party assessment that the third party is going to go through very quickly and might not give you a good sense of their control environment. So our third party assessment is, is complete, but it's not, it's not 200 questions. So it does cover cover kind of all the requirements that we have um, and it's embedded. It's embedded on within the onboarding documentation and the onboarding processes. So if you are a third party to NetBank, you will undergo um, the necessary third party assessments. Um, also, I spoke about audit earlier. Get your audit functions involved in testing that onboarding process. Make sure that it works. Make sure that there are, are, are no gaping gaps or that haven't been considered. Um, privacy by design, it's, it sounds fantastic, very difficult to implement, but privacy by design means that everything that your organization does from its strategy to the rollout of new products, to the engagement of, of potential new clients, to the onboarding of, of, of new staff members, make sure that you've kind of embedded privacy in everything. So within NetBank, we have a, a number of things that kind of support that. So if you're a new joiner to NetBank, you would receive some sort of awareness. A new joiner from a, a staff perspective, you would receive some sort of information about privacy. If if one of our projects is about to, or if a project is about to kick off, we would put them through privacy impact assessments that are easy for them to complete, that are easy for us to review, and, and easy for us to track any gaps that they might have to kind of, close out. I think the most important part about privacy by design is to make it extremely, extremely practical for business to kind of adopt and, 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 and use. Um, business is extremely key in privacy by design. I think engaging with business and understanding some of the complexities that they have is key in making sure that we make the right decisions in some of the things that we're rolling out. The next point is data retention. And I think Data retention is an, an another one of those extremely tricky aspects. In, in the ideal world, privacy doesn't 
introduce data retention. I think data retention has been in play for the longest time. So based on the fact that we are a bank, we have around 109 pieces of legislation to which we must consider and adhere to. And a lot of those pieces of legislation have had a, had a retention period for the longest time. Um, what's important for organizations to do is understand what that regulatory universe looks like. So how many pieces of legislation does your industry need to consider? The next part of that is understanding your data and using your data or categorizing your data and putting your data into buckets um, and then applying that, that retention period into the bucket. So you'll know that next week, Tuesday, I will have 500 records pertaining to the Banks Act or the Companies Act or Occupational Health and Safety that I no longer need, right? And I think um, behind that comes your, your business processes. So how does business actually do this? So it's, it's all fine and well that you have your regulatory universe and you have your records retention schedule, but if you were to give that to business, business wouldn't have the slightest idea of how to, to actually run those or, or, or use that information that you gave them. So what is important is that you have practical processes that help business identify data. So they know that they have the following 2000 records pertaining to a certain type of, of category. They can check that data. So next week Tuesday, when next week Tuesday does come around, they know that they need to delete that data. The other option, data is extremely valuable. And, and we heard Derek and, and Peter talk about um, the data. Data is extremely valuable. You might not always need to know that it's Nilesh Mulji and his ID number and his cell phone number. You might just need to know that there was a certain demographic of a certain age group that lived in a certain area that bought something. And you can completely de-identify de that information. So you don't need to have identifiable information. And if you de-identify information, suddenly your risk is a lot lower. And, th and the last piece of this puzzle is how do you get rid of data? So if you had to go and ask business, do you know how to get rid, get rid of your data? They should know. Um, and, and your process that talks to kind of the, the disposal of data is extremely, extremely important. Um, the next one is enhancing security safeguards. Um, and Andrew is, is gonna talk to us next about kind of the detail behind this. So there's gonna be a lot of detail behind that, but I think the important part here is, is to know your environment. Assess your environment, know your risks, know your, your, your points of attack, and that is through threat modeling. So before, go through an exercise of, of, of going through, it's a very valuable exercise, and th threat modeling does kind of uh, highlight who your threat threat actors are, who your, what your threat or your attack vectors could be, um, but it also kind of forces you to identify your crown jewels. What is important to you as an organization? It might be a client database, it might be an, a, a, an HR database. What exactly are your crown jewels and what are the risks related to those crown jewels? So, so extremely important. I think if you think about Poppy, it is called the protection of personal information. And if you can get the security right to your within your organization, almost half the battle is won because you are, would be protecting that information from, from leaving the organization. The next point um, is managing, managing incidents. Um, and incidents happen. You, you cannot avoid incidents from, from happening. And, 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 and this is something that, that, that we learned. I think we had, um, you would have seen in the media, we had uh, our breach in, in FIB and, and, and that breach kind of occurred because of a third party with whom we were sharing personal information, but incidents happen. And I think the most important part here is to learn from those incidents that happen. I mean, we, we, we could have an incident where a, a really good staff, non-malicious does his work, just has an off day and sends a client file to the incorrect recipient. And, and I think many of us in, in the session would have accidentally sent an email to the wrong recipient. And, and those things happen. But I think the important part behind incident management, over and above having your robust process that involves various kind of role players within your organization. So business, information security, um, HR, all of those kind of parties need to be part of your incident management process. But the most important part of 
having incidents is learning from them. Using the incidents that you do have for trending and analysis, extremely, extremely important because it helps you improve how you manage privacy within your organization. It, 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 it's definitely a great kind of metric that you should not, that you should use. Um, and for me, when we do have a, a privacy incident, it's kind of game time because it gets it gives me an opportunity to test what we've rolled out in the entire program and what we have running as business of you as usual. Um, the next point talks to the registration of your information officer, and, and and maybe I should have started with this as well. This is in no specific order, and this is not every single thing. Uh, these are just some of the, the key things that I want to highlight to the audience today. Uh, registration of the information officer and the deputies. So we do know, and, and I think everyone for the longest time has been waiting for the information regulator to give us our enforcement date. Every year, business would come and say, hey, Nilesh, do we have our enforcement date yet? And I always say, I'd always say next year is the year and next year would come and it would not be the year. And I think uh, I was actually joking about this earlier in a presentation that I did earlier in the month. And, and I can finally say hand on heart that this year is the year. I think our, our, our date is the 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 first the the end of July or the or the first of, of, of end of June or the first of July is by when we need to be compliant. Uh, March is kind of when the information regulator is expecting responsible parties within South Africa to start registering their information officers and their deputies. So there is guidelines published on the information regulator website with all of that information. Um, they also kind of prescribe who the information officer should be. Um, and I, th I think in, in all of that guideline is there. I think um, the CEO in, in, in most cases needs to be in the in, needs to be the information officer and they are allowed to kind of mandate certain deputies to kind of manage. Um, moving on to the next point, and, and I am kind of conscious of time, the role of the compliance officer and audit is extremely, extremely important. The monitoring and enforcement of privacy legislation kind of falls within the compliance space um, and, and, and they would conduct annual assessments of how businesses and clusters and, and business units within clusters are able to comply with the provisions of, of, of POPIA. Um, a lot of value can be gained. I think a lot of businesses and business units are afraid of compliance and their big stick and audit and, and what they can do, but there is a lot of value in engaging with all audit and your compliance office and keeping them close. I think if they are part of the journey, it makes life so much easier when they do identify certain observations and so certain audit findings. It also kind of makes engagement in terms of a green remediation kind of a lot more practical. Um, so that brings me to kind of the, the things that I would want to kind of look at um, in, in if, if it was a future me kind of giving guide, guidance to somebody that was just kind of starting out on their privacy journey. These are the kind of things that I would be, be looking at. I think keep your keep it keep it simple. Make sure you engage with business. Make sure you understand the data that you are processing. Your crown jewels, all extremely, extremely important. Uh, we've got one more uh, presenter and then we'll go to questions. And I see some really interesting questions coming up in the Q&A. And please add any if you want to add in terms of the talk you're about to hear and any of the previous ones or just any thoughts you might have. Um, our, final um, our final presenter is Mr. Andrew Whitaker. And um, Andrew is an executive at Ultron Security. It's a division of the, um, the bigger Ultron TMT group. Um, Andrew is commercially responsible for uh, delivery strategy and business development of identity security and data privacy practices. Um, the group, the um, company Ultron Security partners with customers in South Africa, the rest of Africa and the UK to provide a guide through the most challenging security problems. Uh, the company has four pillars. It's got um, um, identity, security, data protection, 
cloud security architecture and managed security services. And um, he um, serves a role that um, actually brings him in regular working contact with information security, risk management, architecture, audit, and uh, digital transformation departments of some of the largest organizations in South Africa. So I'm very keen to hear what uh, Cherry on the top, Andrew puts. So over to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Professor Barry, and thank you very much for having me here today. It's really been fascinating in the, the discussion to start today with the bigger picture of data and how privacy is relevant and to begin focusing down onto the local context into South Africa with Nilesh. Obviously, data privacy is relevant and it's important. And as we've heard in the conversations today, it's complex. Um, I really enjoyed Nilesh's presentation where he took us through many of the Popea recommendations, which provide organizations with a great framework to understand how better to protect our consumer personally identifiable information. And in my session today, I'd like to perhaps focus on from a security perspective rather than compliance, some of the innovative things that I'm seeing in the customers that we're working with. Um, as Professor Barry introduced, my name is Andrew Whitaker. I'm the executive responsible for delivery at Ultron Security across our identity and our data privacy practices. Uh, we, we deliver these services here locally in South Africa, rest of Africa and in, and in the United Kingdom. And the customers, the leading brands that we're working with are all grappling to address these immense challenges in an innovative way that helps the consumer, but also addresses the compliance goals. And if you look at this picture here, our customers being in the middle, ultimately we think that there's two fundamental things that need to be secured. It's quite obvious, really, we've spoken about them over and over again today. It's the identities, it's the people, and it's the data that we have. Um, there's a really unique set of use cases, though, that we can create from a security context when looking at these two areas. But before I talk about some of those use cases, maybe just to talk about what we as consumers are looking for these days. When we're taking a look at a brand that we want to invest in, whether it's banking, insurance, retail, the choices that we have are just a click away. And, and quite often the experience and the customer journey of that brand is so vitally important. Um, consumers invest when they feel that there is a sense of trust that is built into that brand. And the choice that presents them is that if that trust is ever lost, uh, it may impact directly on organizations and their ability to attract customers. And this is the challenge that compliance and security individuals are balancing. Dr. Keats earlier in his presentation had a similar scale. Ultimately, we need to do the right things from a security perspective to ensure trust. But we, the consumers, want that trust with a great user experience. And for a long time, security has approached the, the, the concept of trust with putting as many controls on as we can. And that just doesn't work today. If you want to create a great consumer experience, then the elements of security that we need to have needs to be adaptive and intelligent, and it needs to be in place at the right time. And if you consider leading cloud providers, Google, Facebook, Instagram, they are very secure, but that security is almost transient. You don't notice it until it needs to be there. And these are the things that organizations that we at Ultron Security partner with are grappling today. And I'd like to take you through some of the innovative things that we're seeing that they're doing to help protect your and my information and ensure the privacy of our data. Ultimately, it comes back down to an identity. The identity is really important. We all want a hyper personalized experience. And to be able to do that, organizations need to be able to know about us and to be able to secure us um, in a 360 degree context. I'm going to touch on a few examples of this. I'm going to talk about passwordless authentication. I'm going to talk about consent, so vital in a data privacy world. And I'm also going to give an example of collaboration where organizations like banks are collaborating with fintechs. And in those worlds, we need to ensure that the security that's really good in the parent organization like a bank applies out to third party relationships in banking. This is a concept called open banking. But let me just start by saying that large organizations that we are consumers of their services 
struggle from day one just to create us as a single person. If you think about your interactions with large organizations, there's many product houses and many product offerings. So a fundamental step that we see all organizations already have undertaken here in South Africa is to be able to consolidate the information they have about us. Nilesh talked about it, know about the data that you have and where it is and be able to use it in an effective way. So this data consolidation is vitally important for an organization to see me as a person, maybe not a user account in area A or area B. Once we know about me as a person, clearly every time I interact with the brand digitally, we need to make sure it really is me behind that transaction. Previously, that was usernames and passwords. As the industry became more secure, it was a SMS to our phone. But today, there's much more clever and better customer experience ways of doing these things. We call these passwordless authentication. Users provide a username and through push notification to their mobile device or even better, perhaps biometric authentication, we're able to tell that this really is the person behind the transaction. None of this surprises you. You do this every day when interacting with digital brands. But passwordless authentication is going even further where perhaps we don't even need to provide that username. The customers that we're partnering with are investing in QR code type authentication mechanisms. So when you go to the website of a particular organization you want to interact with and you have an app on your phone from that company, you're able to simply scan the QR code and the app on your phone can authenticate you strongly if required and you're signed in. Again, this balance of security, which is strong and ensures trust, but also making a great customer experience, which is something that we so deeply require as consumers. During the course of today, we spoke a lot about data and how our actions create this immense data set. Even our interaction with a website while we're trying to buy a car and choosing colors and various accessories leaves a trail of who we are and what we are choosing in terms of our preferences. Organizations need this information for good business decisions, but in line with things like Popia, it's now important for us as consumers to be aware of that and to be able to provide consent for that information to be stored and utilized. So again, a focus on identity, not just the data, but the person behind the transaction and the experience of a person with an organization as a single entity, not various user accounts, means that we can now allow Andrew, the consumer, to manage his consent to the data that we're storing about him in one way, one central way. We know about everything that an organization is collecting about us and we're able to approve or change our mind in the future about the information that they're having for us. I talked earlier about open banking. There's um, in the European Union uh, legislation called Payment Services Directive 2 in the United Kingdom has been implemented as a separate law based on PSD2 called open banking. And really what it's trying to create is a level playing field in the financial services industry where the people that have big sets of information like one of the top banks, is able to share that information in a secure fashion with a smaller startup organization like a fintech provider. Take, for example, a provider who wants to give you investment advice or um, budgeting. It would be fantastic for this fintech to have access to your transactional history at your bank. Open banking lays a framework out for how these organizations that store the data can share it with these trusted fintechs. But critical in that, again, is consent. The ability for a individual to, through a third party, let their institution that holds the data know that that information is good to share. And it's just great to see that standards like open banking, even though it's not law in South Africa for us to be doing it, are widely utilized across the banking sector to be able to provide that innovative edge and create larger ecosystems, um, putting identity and data privacy foremost in front of the business models that these organizations have. What's going to be interesting going forward, though, is that there's going to be larger sets of identity data, not just the information that corporate organizations are collecting about us, that we will want to start sharing with people. For example, vaccines are the topic of the day. How are we going to be able to share the status of vaccination with individuals or with trusted organizations, surely not only a card. So our identity is much more than what we as consumers share with one organization. It's all of that. 
And in a recent roundtable event that we held, which had some banking customers and some South African telecommunication customers, at the end in the Q&A, a very interesting question was asked of us, and, and that is, who, whoever asked these large organizations to become the custodians or, of our identities? We trust these big companies, we do, and therefore we assume that if we receive an SMS to be able to prove our identity and type in the one-time PIN that we got, that we trust the organization that we received it with. But with the prevalence of SimSwap fraud in South Africa, often we go back to our telecommunications provider and blame them for the identity theft. But who put them in control of our identity? The, the question was asked in this forum, maybe it's not the big corporate organizations that we trust the most, maybe it's government. But perhaps we can take that one step forward. Maybe it's ourselves. Ultimately, our identity, our data privacy, should be in our own hands and shouldn't be something that we have to only rely on large organizations to be responsible for the compliance of. And again, the emergence of standards such as self-sovereign identity utilizing blockchain for us to be able to store snippets of our identity information and choose who we share those passports with is a technology that I see within corporate South Africa, organizations looking very strongly to adopt to be able to ensure that the information that we have is not solely at the discretion of the customer organization that we're dealing with, but rather in our own hands. So digital identity passports that exist today, if you look at passports on your Apple iPhone, are extending even further to be able to allow us to collate digital identity information and be responsible for it. So I think with that, I'd like to wrap up my section of the presentation, hand it back over to Professor Barry. But maybe just to say, we've heard a lot about data, privacy, compliance, um, and from a security perspective, what makes me very hopeful is that there is an industry behind this, keeping up with innovative technologies to be able to ensure that our privacy can be kept a secret or shared when we want it to be shared. So thank you, Professor Barry, very grateful for being here. Well, thank you, um, Andrew, and uh, thank you so much for the pre presentation and indeed uh, some thought-provoking information you have given. Um, now, um, it is time for us to take uh, questions. Um, there are a few that have already been posted, um, so we will start with a couple and uh, then uh, forward them through uh, to the various speakers and uh, we'll have them then uh, be answered. So I think the very first one um, which was sent through, which is quite simple, is uh, how do we, the people, ensure the system does not become a tool for human control? And I think this would have been sent uh, initially to Prof uh, Cochrane um, as you were making your presentation. Uh, would you mind uh, to, to take that one, sir? Sure, I'm happy to uh, address that for you. Uh, what I was um, trying to illuminate throughout um, uh, the presentation was that whatever we consider the situation today from a privacy and control situation it is going to get hundreds of times worse than it already is. Um, generally speaking um, industry, corporations, institutions are on the back foot uh, in as much that um, the, uh, the dark side of the force, the um, uh, the criminals um, are always one step ahead. Now, um, one of the one of the really dangerous things that's happening is technology is being rolled out in mass uh, on the IoT and in other domains with known, um, not intended, but with known very very poor uh, security uh, for information and security. And uh, we need to start thinking differently and I would suggest we start with what is really uh, important. One of the greatest defense mechanisms this, in this region uh, is um, uh, uh, hidden in plain sight or defense by obscuration, having so much data up there that people find it very difficult to find whatever they're looking for. Um, I agree with all the speakers uh, that have been on this morning and um, I, um, I've been there, I've done it, 
uh, in my past in British Telecom and in uh, a number of other domains. And I have to tell you that if you go into, for example, the startup domain, nobody gives a, a fig about GDPR or data protection or any regulation. They're too busy trying to survive. And certainly in the academic sphere, um, it's, it's very uh, relaxed and freewheeling. So I will put my hand up at this time and say, I have never asked anybody's permission to copy their email into um, a list of people uh, who might be interested in something or who need to be connected. Now, according to the Data Protection Act in the UK, I'm supposed to ask your permission if I can connect you to somebody I think who would be interesting for you to talk about or who's got a technology that could advantage you. That just doesn't happen. Uh, and so there's, um, uh, I think a, a little bit of reality is required on what is actually happening. Now, there's another aspect to this that people don't mention is that the people that write the legislation uh, have actually got absolutely no means of um, monitoring what people are doing or enforcing it. So it, it's like having a legal system in a country but with no, no police force or with a minimal police force or a non-effective police force. So this encourages people uh, not to adhere to uh, uh, the letter of, of what's being asked. I hope that uh, gives an insight. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor Cochran. And um, we'll uh, pick up a few more points, but I do agree that there is quite a lot of issues around how we enforce the, the legislation, and it's also worried me a lot. Um, a few questions have come in that I'm um, inspired by the talk by Professor Cochran around um, connected uh, devices and these huge numbers that the Internet of Things is going to throw up. And questions around, um, and you, you touched on it, but it will, will need a lot of energy. It uh, will lead to possibly a radio frequency pollution and and um, possibly some effect, and I'd like your view on this, on humans and animals with all the radiation that will be created. Um, and then um, um, technically in, in terms of having so many devices, um, the questions of latency and bandwidth issues. Um, I know in South Africa we're about to assign spectrum and um, and to look at how we deal with radio spectrum. So um, the, the questions just around the number of devices and how we're going to cope with it. And uh, prior to just um, kind of handing over to you, um, I just want to welcome uh, one of our presenters, Derek Keats, who's now joined us by phone, and he will be answering some of the questions. And I just have to say that I forgot to thank you, Derek. So thanks for your video presentation, but we will come to you in a minute. But uh, um, uh, Professor Cochran, in terms of so many devices, energy, bandwidth, latency, how will we deal with that? Well, let me just get to the kernel of the problem. Nothing, absolutely nothing has happened much in wireless technology since about 1915. It's the same old thing, just continually refined. In fact, there are absolutely no digital radios anywhere. They're all analog radios with modems stuck on the end. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the lineage. Radio started or wireless started with big transmitters, big masts, long distances, a handful of transmitters, and a few million listeners. That world is gone. We've now got billions of transceivers and they're operating not over vast distances, but very, very short distances. The IoT amplifies that. Instead of uh, transmitting a kilometer or two, we're going to be looking at devices uh, transmitting over 10 or 15 or 20 meters that kind of range. 
Now, there's a, uh, this, is, this works with Mother Nature rather wonderfully because of the inverse square law. If we, if we reduce the distance between the transmitter and the receiver by a factor of 10, the amount of energy required uh, is one hundredth and so on. So that square law uh, wins for us. The other big difficulty is that the human race are absolutely besotted on this ancient model of bands and channels and allocation of spectrum. If we started today and we invented wireless this morning, I know this is impossible, but supposing we didn't have wireless and we invented it this morning, I can assure you we would not go long wave, medium wave, short wave, HF, VHF, UHF. We would not go CW, AM, FM, SSB, and so on. We would go digital right from the off. If we get rid of all that intermediate processing that is purely analog and go straight digital, we can use effectively a hyper wideband with code separation as opposed to carving the spectrum up. And then something rather magical happens. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, that uh, you know one day they might be charging us for fresh air. They already do. When governments sell spectrum, they are selling us fresh air. If we adopt a new digital model for wireless communication, which is required for the IoT especially, but is applicable in other places, there will be no spectrum oceans because all the communication will occur under the thermal noise. Now, as far as um, the, the, the problem with the uh, wireless energy, um, this is a really interesting one. Uh, I have never ever visited any uh, wireless installation and seen dead insects around uh, the antenna or birds dead around the antenna. Now, if you go to, uh, this is uh, mobile uh, specifically, if you go to some vastly powerful radar site, of course there's a problem, but that is ring fenced uh, and you don't let people near it. But people are worrying about 5G while sitting in their lounge with a laptop that's using Wi-Fi. And the energy coming from Wi-Fi is thousands of times greater than that from 5G. There has not been a single case on this planet where anyone has been hurt by a mobile phone unless somebody threw it at them. I, I mean, it, it's um, the, the, the propensity uh, for ignorance to promote uh, the worry about nonsensical or non problems is quite profound. Most of this has popped up through the internet, and we've even had um, people selling devices to protect you against um, 5G, and they've had a box with a battery and, a, and an LED and an antenna and nothing inside the box. And people have been spending 500 pounds on these things or they've been putting uh, 5G protection stickers on their children for 40 pounds a piece, and it's a piece of plastic with glue on it. This is crazy, but you can't do anything about it. In the UK, we've had over 110 uh, towers burnt down, uh, none of which were 5G. They were 3 and 4G, and uh, they managed to disable uh, the emergency services. So the way people will get killed by uh, mobile technology is that it won't be there when we need it and somebody won't get an ambulance when they need it. That, that's what we should really be worrying about. So all of this has got technology solutions. One thing's for sure, uh, we can't afford to have 5G and have everything on 5G. I mean, it's unworkable. Uh, there isn't the bandwidth available. And there isn't, uh, you know, in the UK, we need 50,000 towers for full coverage. That's not going to happen. So um, the most likely solution is that all of your office, uh, your, your uh, medical uh, devices, uh, your appliances uh, and your commercial goods will go on your Wi-Fi, which, which is quite adequate and, and it's low power. Uh, so 
I mean, I quite humorously, as you as we talk about this, I have a Bluetooth link between each year. My hearing aids talk to each other, uh, and I'm quite happy about that radiation passing through my brain. By the way, well, on that rather humorous um, point, uh, Prof. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, one, one, one is uh, particularly around um commercialization or monetization monetization of our data uh, cookies personal information is a cut um can we place a price tag on our data and send it to the highest bidder um a sort of uh, open market where the big uh, tech pays for access use of our data uh, from large servers where they can um where they may be stored um, I think next one is close to it. It says people often misunderstand ownership when it comes to their technology. You own the hardware, but more often than not, tech companies claim ownership of, the, of their software, services, and what is made available to you. Some even take it a step further and claim to own your posts and what you create on your platform. Um, I'm sure this one could go to uh, Dr. Kids um, because you mentioned some of these. Dr. Kids, are we there? Um, Dr. Kids has just dropped off. I think he's 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 just lost his uh, connectivity. My phone. Okay. Um, well, um, shall we? Shall I give you a comment on this? Yes, please. Go on, go, on, yes. go on to my homepage. You can take anything off there. There is no copyright, and I do not require any attribution. You can just take any of it. I give it all away. My choice. It overcomes all the problems in one fell swoop. And my reason for doing this is that um, if I give a present like patient like this um, every day of the week over an entire year, I may influence a few thousand people. If I just let people run riot on my homepage and take what they want, then I can influence millions of people. I think Dr. Dr. Keith is back on. Um, Dr. Keith, did you hear the question or were you off already? Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, I don't know what happened there. I was just about to speak and uh, everything went to, went 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 haywire. So, uh, okay. could you ask the question again, please, if you don't mind? Okay. Um, there was one question around monetizing personal data, um, as um, cookies, personal information, and and saying, can we get the highest bidder to pay for our personal information? A sort of open market where big tech pays for access use of our data from a large servers where they may be stored. And I link that with another one that said people often misunderstand, uh, misunderstand ownership of uh, um, information when it comes to their technology. Um, you own the hardware, but uh, more often than not, the tech company claim ownership to the software services and what made uh, what is made available to you. Some even take it a step further and claim to own your own post, uh, post and what you create on their platform. OK, so I'll take the, uh, the second one first. Um, this is around ownership of the different elements of the technology spec from the hardware um, to the software. Um, and this is true, and there are two kinds of, uh, of software that uh, that exists in the technology stack. One of them is proprietary technology, which is typically owned by companies, and you have no control over it and no understanding of what goes on inside of it. And there is free and open source software where you have access to the software, you have access to the source code. It's uh, typically licensed in such a way that you can use it <clears throat> for any purpose um, and you don't need any particular permissions for that. So unfortunately, much of the world uh, is operated on proprietary technologies 
Uh, but me, in my own personal use of technology since 2001, I have not used proprietary technologies other than a few applications on my cell phone. Um, because I prefer the situation where I have control of the of the technology spec, the software uh, technology spec, not where some company has control of it. So you do have a choice uh, in in that regard. Uh, most people take the easy route because computers come with uh, operating systems already installed, and um, we all know what that one typically is. And uh, so you you don't really have a you don't really have a choice in terms of what happens under the hood in those kinds of technologies. Um, then the, there was a question regarding um, whether uh, whether there could be an open market for individual user data. Um, I, I suppose there are some places where that's almost the case today. Uh, I, I'm not very familiar with what's happening in terms of um, the data brokers, uh, but there is a whole industry around data brokerage. Uh, people who get access to data, who uh, find publicly accessible open uh, sources of data that it could be via government websites, it could be via social media, and put together profiles and then sell those profiles. So effectively, what you're you're saying is an open market for you to become a voluntary subject of a data broker. That's very scary. Uh, I hope it never happens. <laughs> but uh, given that people often will will sell anything, I suspect that if it did happen, there would be lots of takers. Whether they would be the kind of subjects that a data broker would be looking for or not is another question. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, that's the best I can come up with. Well, we thank you. Prof Berry, some questions from you? Yes, um, and I would like to put um, put a few questions and it'll go to um, to our two other presenters, to Nilesh and um, to Andrew. So uh, there's a question on the list uh, specifically to you, uh, Nilesh, about uh, personal data shall not be kept. It's it's a quote and says personal data shall not be kept in a form which permits identification of the data subject. And it's asking, does this mean that we would therefore need to de-identify or mask the information? And if you could give your thoughts on that, and then um, a question um, or two two joint questions to Andrew. Um, there's a question around big data and smart uh, data, and if you want to um, tackle that. But then a very interesting question also around bio, uh, um, uh, biometrics, and are they becoming more central in banking security? Um, however, we're seeing um, data breaches, and uh, we could uh, change our, our um, password but we can't change our fingerprint or our, our facial map. So um, could you comment on that in terms of uh, how we deal with biometrics and uh, data breaches? So if we can begin with maybe Nilesh and then go straight on to Andrew. Sure, thanks. And I think a good question. I think just understanding or, or understanding what, what is meant by information should not exist on a form but I will kind of provide my view. So personal information should be collected for a specific purpose. That purpose is usually is usually defined by business and that and then collected for that purpose. So for example, name, surname, ID number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the act does talk to the fact that it should not be retained longer than its purpose has been fulfilled. So for example, if, if you buy a vehicle and you finance that vehicle for five years. So then you would say, okay, its purpose has been fulfilled, but then you would look at any other pieces of legislation that prescribed a retention period on top of that. So um, we would look at any credit specific pieces of legislation that also kind of provide a retention period. And we would use that as, as our base. When we depersonalize information, I think this is a, an important point, I think, Depersonalized information means that we can no longer ever identify the person behind that and we kind of completely remove any associated risk. I spoke about this earlier as well. So 
if a record contains my name, my surname, my ID number, my cell phone number, and we remove that by depersonalizing that record completely, it's of no value to, to me anymore because the risk is completely gone. So all it would be would be a, a few associated transactions. Um, and the value in that is it could be used by credit analysts, it could be used by a number of different functions within organizations to derive the value that they may want without actually knowing that it was Nilesh Mulji's information. So I, th I think that was the first part of the question. Um, the second part, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it back to, to you, Barry. I think Andrew, it, it refers to the biometrics elements and selecting a solution for that. Yes, Andrew, if you could tackle that. Um, Andrew, are you still on? Andrew, please. Apologies. Your mind is yeah, there's, there's always that one person that forgets the mute button. My apologies about that. Um, I, I think it's a great question about when does data become smart data? Um, I saw there was another question as well relating to um, the, the, the relevance of open banking on data privacy. And I'd maybe like to touch back on in my conversation talking about open banking a little bit. Um, data becomes smart data when you're able to share it and use it intelligently for purposes that makes the customer's life, the consumer's life better. That's my opinion. Um, in the UK, there was a law created around how people should share data. I don't know if anything good ever came from a law telling people they have to do it. Um, and the implementations that were made of open banking uh, didn't probably yield the results that the laws wanted to. What I'm thrilled to see in South Africa, we've been having open banking conversations, which is really a collection of standards and approaches to how you share information between organizations in a secure way and still make sure that the consumer is in charge of that and approves at every step of the way. And we make sure it's the consumer behind the consent every time um, has been done without the need for any laws. There were no laws in South Africa that said we needed to do it. Banks like NetBank did it off their own free will because they wanted to see the value of sharing that information with other organizations that could do better things with that information. So um, sometimes what is law is better left to people to do themselves, I think, and that can make smart data. And then just the question about biometrics, that's a very interesting question. The statement there was saying with the, with the rights to date, with the, with, the rel with the amount of data breaches that are happening, how long until our faces are stolen, our biometric information is stolen. Something that I'm seeing a lot of these days is that organizations going through EKYC processes, onboarding a customer, don't rely simply on a picture of your face. Obviously there's biometric data that underlies that, but the concept of genuine presence makes sure that it's not someone injecting your picture into that webcam or heaven forbid buying a mask, which is possible, to buy a mask credit of your face and pretending to be you. There, there are ways using lights on your screen, lights on your camera to be able to ensure that the person behind the transaction really is sitting there. So it's a difficult question, but I think it's much more complex than just the biometric data being stolen. I, I think there's a lot of other fail safes built into strong authentication. Thanks, Professor Barry. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, there are still so many interesting questions, but um, I think time has caught up with us and um, we'll uh, um, kind of tie it up here, but um, please, if people have questions, uh, reach out to us and we will help you reach out to panelists to get your questions answered by them. Um, but um, I just want to say that the uh, question that we, we started off with, was who owns my data and why should I care? And that uh, really, I think we, we've we tackled this in terms of what is data, what is ownership and why should we care? And we've seen um, a whole gamut of, of interesting things that are happening in this um, digitally transformed world in terms of um, data and how much data uh, there will be and the risks that that brings and legislation and other things. So um, I want to just hand back to Tabang, but on my side, a big thank you to our panelists. It's been a fantastic panel and I really appreciate your participation. 
and also to all the people watching. And we will be releasing this in due course as a recording. But for the last word, if I can hand over to Taban. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And I wish to thank uh, everybody who's participated, particularly Prof Cochrane, all the way from uh, the UK, uh, Priya, um, for welcoming our presenters and uh, Dr. Keith for going through the travel and recording our uh, the video for us and stimulating as with your presentation, Nilesh, for share, sharing the protection of information from a net bank point of view, but particularly also looking at the poppy. Andrew, for your vast knowledge and sharing the in practice information and what you do to protect uh, information uh, along your work um, in and at, at Altron. As always, for the like, excellent cooperation, um, I wish to thank Prof. Barry Dualeski and Chris Yilan, Tula Damini, Katla Homohase, the NetBank communication and social media teams for their fantastic behind the scene work. Lastly, and most importantly, uh, you, the audience and participants in this webinar, please be on the lookout for more thought provoking and leadership uh, uh, webinars that we shall be holding in, in 2021. And as we close, I am Tabang Chilwani and I wish to thank you all and goodbye. Until next time.